I can't even hear myself, so I wouldn't know how bad it is. Uh, but as we were talking, uh, as I was mentioning, there are prayer, prayer requests that maybe we want to make known, and there's a lot of good things that are going on. This week we celebrated graduation, and uh, Emma made it. It was a close call. Uh, but now, and Maddie too, uh, since they're both basic, basically valedictorians and did a great job. But we're so proud of them. That was a great time of celebration. Uh, and there were many other things. People got to spend time with grandbabies, and somehow their baby's here today. They've been ill, so there's a lot of positive things being in the house of the Lord. It is not tornadoing right now. The storm last night was not near as bad as they, you know, tell you when it comes up on the alert. So there's a lot to praise the Lord about on this day. Amen. And so I want to kind of go to uh, share a couple things today. A lot of activities, kind of exciting news too. We're starting a new uh, church in Ruston at the Holiday Inn today at three o'clock this afternoon. So be in prayer for Tom Franks and the group as they uh, start that new launch. Uh, also, uh, we'll be traveling to uh, Oak Grove, Josh Canfield, the youth pastor gets ordained and that's been a long process. He's part of a new process uh, that he did. So a lot of traveling. I know Dana today and, and Liam's other grandmother will be grandmother uh, goes to Nashville day and they'll be driving. So a uh, big prayer for my wife and uh, Miss Rita Cook as they drive to Nashville today to, to get Liam uh, this, later this week. Uh, also, I know Karen Clawson, Sister Amy are, and the boys both are, are gonna be going and driving, I think Thursday or Wednesday, Thursday. Uh, up to Indiana, so we're going to be praying for them, and then flying back, uh, Amy will be flying back, she doesn't get to stay too long over the boys, so we want to be praying for safety, and I know there's many others perhaps that are traveling too, a lot of traveling going on, so I want to remember that in prayer as well. Also, uh, I was thinking as the worship team uh, was singing the Lauren Daigle song, You Say, and I wanted to share, you know, it seems like what God says of me, and sometimes we get tired and weary and well-doing, you know, we, we do, don't we? You know, and, and if it's not true, then why would there be a scripture that says, no, I'm good. What, what, what way to get tired and, and if the scripture didn't say, don't get weary and well-doing? Well, I'll admit to you in front of everybody, I get sometimes weary and well-doing. And I bet you do too. And it felt like this morning I was listening to worship music on the way trying to get you know, in the spirit and just thinking about it. And it's like the Lord reminded me in Psalms 139 how much he loves me, how much his thoughts are toward me. And even when I think I'm not doing good or I even think I'm not worthy, have you ever been there? And, and I even think maybe I'm not on the right side of the whole deal. Like I'm in darkness. Read Psalms 139 and it just touched me it says that even if you go to the place of death, or even if you go to the darkness, your light will come to me, and so guess what will happen? There's no darkness. So even if I think I'm in the darkness, I'm surrounded by the light. And what that light is, is the love of God for you and me. And that's encouraging to me. And I don't know, sometimes we just get in that blah, and we need to be reminded. And based on looking at some of you today, I'm being real honest from up here, you really need that. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to do a couple things. See, we've already been weird this morning, right? We've been different. You've been sitting down. In a few moments, you're going to stand up. But you're going to do something that's really rarely ever occurs, and especially to trace jokes. You're going to smile. So right now, we're going to practice. This is very important. And I'm not, not being critical because, I, look, I'm ugly. I got it. I should get an ugly check from the government. I got that. But here's the thing I do want to tell you. You look better if you smile. So one, two, three, smile. There you go, look at you. One, two, three, this side, smile, dad, try. Yeah, there you go. Okay, now Shannon, I know you can do it. Smile, there you go, beautiful. Isn't that awesome? Let's stand. You feel better already. Fathers, we go to prayer this morning and we've heard the worship songs. And Lord, there's so many awesome messages that come through those songs. But you do say a different thing about us, and it's always good than what Satan says about us and the forces of evil. And Lord, we go through life, and there's just times we get kind of down. And Lord, even when we're up spiritually deep in our heart and our faith, 
we kind of go through times it's just a searching or blah or whatever's going on. God, it's awesome to know that you're right there with us. Or can we just, in the midst of the junk, smile and know you're there? that you will never leave us, never forsake us. So I rebuke Satan and anything that he puts in all our minds to know this day we declare you are with us always. We are committed to you and you are more than committed to us. There is now no condemnation in those who have accepted Christ Jesus. So Lord, we believe that. And Lord, we cast all our cares and anxieties to you. There are my brothers and sisters here this morning that have many cares, physical, spiritual, emotional, Lord, all kinds of needs, family needs, financial needs, just struggles, Lord, maybe even attitudes that we have. We cast them to you right now. And Lord, we know that you are God, you're able, and you care, and Lord, we pray that your will would be done in all these situations. Guide us, nudge us, open doors, close doors. Be with us, we pray. And Lord, every need that's been mentioned and the hundred or so that's on our prayer list, every need there, God, we cast to you. May your will be done. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. Ushers. Right. Kids, you can head to Children's Church. Someone wanted me on the floor today. I kind of like being a little bit higher than that. Not so that I can speak down to you. That's not what I mean by that at all. Well, good morning. How are y'all today? Good. Good. I, I, I'm, I'm a little tired and a little sore, um, but that's okay. My, my brother is in the process of moving and um, since he drove up to Indiana to help me move, move here, I felt I only owed it to him to do the same and help him move. Um, but, uh, well, this morning we, uh, we begin into a, a new series that's going to take us about four weeks. Um, about two months ago, you guys all received a card that looked kind of like this. And, and many of you wrote down questions. And, uh, and we're going we're gonna to go through uh, three or four of those questions over the next three or four weeks, and we're going to talk about uh, what they mean and how we can engage those and go through those. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about who has the right to approach God, who has the right to talk to Him, and what do you expect with that. Uh, next week, uh, we're going to be doing something really special as we, as we explore what it is to love our neighbors. And when we do that, uh, we're going to try something. This will be the second year that we've done this. Um, and so come next week dressed to go back outside these doors. So come fairly casual. But when you gather, we're going to come together. We're going to worship together. And I'm going to give you a shopping list to go to Brookshire's and to go to one of the dollar stores. And we're going we're gonna to purchase items to love on one of the ministries that we serve, Grace Place. And so uh, that we, you'll have, when, when I dismiss you next Sunday, you'll have 40 minutes to go shopping and to bring it back here. Now here's the beauty of doing that. Um, I can tell you from almost two years of being here, if there is someone in need in our congregation and we pass an offering plate 
to take up a little bit of money for someone, we're going to get five to six hundred dollars in doing that. And that is really good. That's a great fast offering. But what I've found over years is that when you ask people to get involved, and, and by that I mean actually, actually start dreaming and thinking and wondering what that looks like. Last year, the very first time we ever did this, you guys went out and in 40 minutes you spent $1,500. You spent three times the amount of money you would have given in cash by going and actually buying groceries for someone. And so we're going to encourage that again this year. So that'll be next week. Uh, the week after that, we're going to talk about righteousness uh, based on one of the questions. And each week, I'll show you the question. And then the week after that, we're going to talk about the Ark of the Covenant. Um, that'll be a very interesting one as we see the progression and transition of how God speaks and how God carries out. And this is, this is what it appeared on on my form. And so there's... Uh, if, if this is your question, I'm not asking you to raise your hand today at all by any means. I just hope that I answer it appropriately to what you intended to ask because we don't have a ton of space on here. But did normal people ever call out to God? Is it written that someone initiated a conversation with God and what would happen if they did? And so we're going to take this as three separate questions, and we're going to kind of walk through this today. And we're going to talk about how you and I are impacted by this very question. So, so first and foremost, normal people. Is there anyone in this room who considers themselves normal? No, I know you. You're not. But neither am I. <laughs> and so the term normal is, is not a great term, but, but let's just ask it this way. Who did God speak to in the Bible? And so there's actually a, quite a bit of people that he spoke to. He spoke to Noah. Um, Noah was called to save the earth, but he battled depression and anger that led him to drunkenness. All right? So is he normal? Mm, no. He just got called out to do something awesome and scary. You know, he spoke to Abraham, the father of our faith. But Abraham was impatient. He couldn't wait long enough to have a child that God promised him, so he went and took care of that himself. Um, he was compulsive. Uh, uh, he, he, <laughs> he just tended to do things haphazardly from time to time to time. And he was a liar. Filth. 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 Fearful. fearful. Yes, he was very fearful. But he, you know, the, the liar deal is exactly that. He, there were a couple of different times that he was afraid for his life, and he thought that if, because Sarah was a very beautiful woman, his wife, uh, that there were kings that wanted her, and so he lied and said, I'm her brother and not her husband, which is just kind of weird to me. But he was, he was still that. Um, we can look at Peter. Peter, let's take a New Testament example. He is the heir apparent to Jesus' ministry. He was the oldest disciple, and he was the second in command. And, and yet, he sank in water. He was quick to the sword in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he denied Jesus three times. So, so when we ask about these normal people, the, the, we often get this idea that the people who made it into the Bible... We're somehow better than us. And the truth of the matter is, is so often what we get is we see small glimpses into a person's life, small times that they get it really right, but the Bible is also very unique because the Bible also records where the most devoted people also got it really wrong. Um, it makes it unique among all religious texts. If you, if you pick up a copy of the Koran, you're never, ever going to see inside that book where the disciples of Muhammad get it wrong. They always build up. But God goes, you know what? I don't use perfect people. And so throughout history, he doesn't talk to perfect people. Instead, we get this. The Bible is full of ordinary people with extraordinary fates because of extraordinary faith. So whether you're talking about Abraham, you're talking about Noah, whether you're talking about Sarah, whether you're talking about Peter or Paul, you're talking about ordinary people who experienced an amazing fate, an amazing opportunity in life, an ex amazing existence because their faith was strong. 
And so that's what our call is. So if you want to know, did God ever talk to ordinary people? He did it all the time. He talks to people today all the time. And you don't have to feel extraordinary. You don't have to feel special because guess what? You already are special. You would not exist. You would not breathe. You would not be here on the earth if you were not special to him. We've talked about this phrase. I've used this phrase a hundred times since I've been here in the last couple of years. But God created you to love you, and he loves you just because he created you. That is who God is, and that's how he sees you. And is that God willing to talk to one of his kids? Oh, yeah. And so we are ordinary people, but we are, we are heirs to the throne of God. And if we will only take that extraordinary faith, he will offer us an extraordinary fate. So let's keep looking through this. Uh, th again, do normal people ever talk, call out to God? Is it written that someone initiated a conversation with God? And what would happen if they did? So has anyone ever sat face to face with God? And yes, the answer to that is yes, there are people who have sat face to face. However, God was typically relocated to one place at one time. So you have situations throughout uh, the history of the world and the history of the Bible where God did sit down face to face, but, but by and large, when, once uh, Moses came onto the scene, after God got the Israelites out of Egypt, they built a room. They built a room in a, ta in a, in a tent, and this tent was a place that Moses would go to sit and visit with God. And the way that they knew this, and, and you, here's an interesting thing. When we talk about face-to-face -face with God, it talks in the scripture that Moses sat and talked to God like a friend. But here's an interesting part of that. The way that the people knew that God was in the tent, because not everyone could see in the tent, was a cloud came down from heaven, went into the front door of the tent, and as far as we ever know, remained a cloud. Abraham was never allowed to see the face of God. By best account, by, by best understanding, no one throughout the entire history of the Bible ever saw God's face. You can't see it this side of heaven. And, and it, there's one portion uh, when, the, when God and Moses are, are in Exodus uh, chapter 20, when they are cutting the covenant for the new test, for the testament, the the Old Covenant now, but it was the New Covenant then. You know, we have the New Testament. This was the Old Testament. Um, when, they, when God was cutting the covenant with Moses to say, I will take the Israelites on as my people, and they will take me on as their God. And that's where they got the Ten Commandments. At that point in time, there's a phrase in there that says that Moses saw God's back. Now, if you're reading that in the King James Version, that's what it says. He saw God's back. If you read that in newer translations, what you'll see is something to the effect of they saw where God was. Now, the reason for that is, is the term the back is literally referring to behind him. And in more recent years, since 1940s with the, with the finding of the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Nag Hammadi Scriptures and some of those, those things that help us have a whole lot more of the Jewish writings from the first century, since then we understand that that, that term back is actually a euphemism. And it really means that, that Moses didn't actually see God's back. He actually saw where God had been. And so when God took the covenant and he split the covenant cow and he walked through the blood of the, 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 the cow, which is how they made covenants. Sorry, that feels, sounds kind of gross in our terms. Now we just write our name on a piece of paper, but we often talk about how it cost an arm and a leg. Well, it could have then. Um, I got one laugh out of that. Thank you, Devin. Um, anyway, uh, <laughs> But uh, what would happen then is to sign a covenant, they would actually take a valuable animal and they would take and they would split it apart and they would drag the, the, the part and the people making the covenant would walk through between and the blood of the animal would be on their shoes. And the statement they make is if I break this covenant, I agree that my body can be treated like this animal. Now, you want to sign your name to that one? You know, I always laughed when I was a banker in my previous life 
uh, when people would come in to sign a mortgage, I'd say, well, now you're giving me rights to your firstborn child. Well, <laughs> not far from that at this point in time. Um, and so when, when God came down, an interesting thing in the Old Covenant is Moses nor the Israelites were ever asked to walk through the cut. Only God walked through. So God's original covenant says, I just need you to respond to my action. Now that's very different than most covenants today. That's very different than most contracts today. If you sign a mortgage on a piece of property today, both parties have to sign that. Otherwise, it's not even legal. But then, in that day and age, God said, you know what? I know you're going to mess this up. And so I'm going to make the promise, and I'm going to ask you to do your best. And so in the Old Testament, once, once the, the Ten Commandments had been cut, there was a tent that was erected, and this is where Moses would meet with God on a daily basis to work out the rest of the Jewish law. And during that time, he talked to God as a friend. And when he came out, his face was brighter than when he went in. It actually says that he would have to wear a veil for three or four days after he would come out because otherwise he would look too weird. <laughs> it's not the exact word it uses, but it, would, it, 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 it essentially says that it kind of freaked everybody out. It kind of scared everyone because he looked more like an angel than like a human. And so it being in the presence of God changed him. Well, in, in the temple, when, when Solomon built the temple and when it was rebuilt again in the Nehemiah days, there, was a, there, were, there were three sections to the temple. There was the outer courtyard, and then you moved in, which was everyone was welcome. There was the inner courtyard where all of the priests were welcome, and then there was the Holy of the Holies. And the Holy of the Holies was this place which was covered and surrounded by a curtain. And we know this curtain, to, it's called a veil in the Old Testament. And this, this veil, we know from, uh, from non-biblical texts, but we, can, we know the, the sizes and shapes of that from, from many of the Jewish writings in the first century, uh, that this curtain was 20 feet high, was 30 feet wide, and was as thick as the hand is wide. Now, it, what is said is that uh, they could hook a team of horses to either end of the curtain and pull on it, and it would bind both teams together. It also uh, is recorded that they would change this curtain out. There was, there was a, a group of women who were continuously making the next veil because they would change out the veil every six months and they would, they, would, uh, they would use one, they would clean it once a month, and they would change it out at the end of six months. And it took 300 rabbis to take the veil down and put the new one up. It was that heavy. It was that big. So what, when, when Jesus, not Jesus, sorry, when, the, when God is relegated to this holy of holies, which is the, the case in the Old Testament, um, this is the only place, and once a year, a rabbi is chosen by lot to go in and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with God, to go in there. Now, what's in the Holy of Holies? In the Holy of Holies, there is uh, a menorah, a candle, that represents the Spirit of God. There is the Ark of the Covenant, which holds uh, Aaron's staff that was used by Moses to split the Red Sea. Uh, it holds some of the manna, and it holds one other thing, right? What did we talk about the other day? Commandments, thank you, yes. <laughs> you, I prepare a lot of time in this, and then all the information gets jumbled in my, in my head, sorry. So you had the Ten Commandments, you had uh, the manna, from heaven and you had the staff of Aaron. Those are inside the Ark of the Covenant. And we'll go much deeper with that later uh, in a few weeks. But, uh, but those are the major things. There's also uh, a bowl of water in there to, to cleanse yourself and then there's also uh, a fire in there for a burnt offering. So those are all in the Holy of Holies. But this is the place where God resides and you're only allowed to go in there once a year to entertain him, to, to be with him to intertangle with him. And then you have Jesus. 
So this is where the New Testament changes that. So who has the right from that point forward to engage God? Well, we know from the biblical, biblical accounts, um, sorry, everyone, this is how we, I was going to, sorry, I've talked through my slides, but not transitioned. In Matthew 27, 51, in Mark 15, 38, and in Luke 23, 45, this phrase is used. When Jesus died, the veil was torn. And it's important that it tells us how it was torn, the manner in which it was torn. There was a mighty earthquake, and the veil was torn from top to bottom. Now, I've already explained to you how heavy, how big, how thick, how indestructible this curtain is. And yet, when Jesus died on the cross, God himself reached down and tore the veil. And what he said is, no longer is this the place you come to engage me, but I will engage you at the place we come together for. And so that changes. So now who has everyone? It is not relegated just to the high priest on a one time a year basis or the few times that God just happens to show up somewhere through angels or other means. Now we have, we have for the next 53 days, we have a holy space that is void or at least is opened for the world to see in. And we have Jesus, just three days later, walking out of a grave and spending time with his disciples. And then we have, on the 50th day after the resurrection, this day called Pentecost. And this day from Pentecost literally means the 50th day. But it was seven weeks, and it was seven weeks later. So seven weeks of seven days on the 50th day the Spirit of God poured out on all of the people. And that's what, that's what Pentecost Sunday is all about. And you have this interaction that actually takes us back and reminds us in the way and the phraseology and everything that happens takes us right back to the time that God gave us the first commandments, that gave us that first testament. And so in that, we are reminded through things like after God gave Moses the Ten Commandments, you may or may not remember, but Moses comes down the mountainside and he finds that the people have turned from God. They have built a large fire. They have taken the golden jewelry that they got out of Egypt. They threw it all into the fire and out of that came this golden bull. And so at that moment, Moses commands the Levites to cleanse the Israelites from those who did that. And we, we learn in Exodus that on that day, in one moment, 3,000 were killed. Now, what happens on the day of Pentecost? When the Spirit of God pours out, it says that 3,000 responded to the call of God. And 3,000 were added to their number. God is making a definitive statement that the completion of my people comes through this New Testament, this new gospel, and it comes because the Spirit is free to all. And so the New Testament says God is no longer relegated to a place. And so we have to ask ourselves, so if everyone is able to initiate this conversation, what then does it look like if we respond. So has anyone ever sat face to face with God? Yes. Now here's the next part of that. What happens to people when they sit face to face with God? Abraham pleads for Sodom. He approaches God and, he, and God says, I'm going to destroy Sodom. And Abraham says, all right, um, why? <laughs> he goes, well, there's, there's, there's not enough righteousness there. He says, so you're telling me, God, this is Abraham speaking, you're telling me that if, there are, that, that, that if there are 50 good people in the city of Sodom, you would destroy them with everyone else? And God goes, oh, no, no. If you find 50 people, we'll, we'll good. I'll save the whole city. Abraham goes, well, well, but what if there's like only 45? Go ahead. Abraham barters all the way down to five people. And God finally goes, all right, look, there's only three people. Get them out. 
And, and, so, and then only two of them make it because Lot's wife turns around to look at, what, at the destruction and she turns to a pillar of salt. It's another story for another time, but that's part of it. All right, so it cost something for Abraham. In Genesis, we get this story in chapter 32 where Jacob, Abraham's grandson, who has, who has separated himself by stealing the blessing from his father, he has separated himself from his brother Esau. There is this story where he is going back to try to reconcile with his brother. And on the night before he meets up with Esau, an angel of God appears to him on the, on the beach. And he's all by himself. And he wrestles, the statement in scripture says, he wrestles with God all night long. And at the end of the night, when the morning breaks, the angel had not defeated Jacob. And so Jacob asks for a blessing. And the blessing is, he changes his name. He changes it from Jacob to the name Israel. And so all of the descendants of Israel are the Israelites. This is where we get the name, the Israelites. Okay? And so in that moment, the angel touches the hip of Jacob and causes him to walk with a limp the rest of his life. He encountered God. He beckoned God. And it changed the way he walked. Kind of important. Moses meets God at the temple of meetings. We talked about that a moment ago. And in the process, his light shines so bright that everyone that sees him knows that he is different after encountering God than he was before he encountered him. Paul in Acts, on the road to Damascus, the first thing God does is blind him. He says, everything you know is wrong. Now let me give you new sight. And everyone who encountered Paul from that point forward was different and changed. Because Paul was different and changed. And so the, the takeaway from this, in all four of these exa examples, and these are just four of them, I could give you another hundred examples throughout Scripture, but when people take it upon themselves to encounter God, and they seek Him out, it changes them. It changes them to the place that the people around them go, what is different with you? I can't tell. Are you glowing? <laughs> Are you not looking at life the same way you used to? Wow, your walk looks totally different. Wow, it looks like you had a loss, but you also had a gain. And so this is the story of the scripture. And so when we go back to that original question of do normal people ever call out to God? Yes. We are all expected to. However normal you feel like you are, you are expected to call out to God. Will he take on that conversation? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. He will take on the conversation. The question is, when you call out and he answers, will you take on the conversation? Because if you truly engage, if you truly get into the conversation with him, it will change you. It will change the way you look at life. It will change the way you look at people. When I first, when I first got into ministry, um, I, I got into ministry with this anticipation of, God has called me to do something more than just sit in a seat on Sunday mornings. He's called me to do more than to just show up at a, at a, at a soup kitchen uh, a quarterly. He's called me to do more than that, but I didn't know what that was. And all of a sudden, the deeper I got into it, I made this statement. This was my statement that I made out loud to a friend of mine. I know everything there is to know about leadership in ministry, but I don't have enough Bible background, so I need to go to school for that. Well, I can tell you, after I left and went to seminary, after four years of seminary, I made this statement. Not only do I think I know everything there is to know about ministry anymore, I don't have the answers. I don't think I'm even asking the right questions anymore. Because God met me there and humbled me. Now, I still don't have all the answers. And neither do you. And the longer you walk with God, the more you will realize that, that the, 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 the arrogance of estimating that we can understand God will be knocked smooth out of you. Because what will happen is you will learn. You will learn that when you look at people that are broken 
And believe me, there are people that are broken everywhere. You're broken, I'm broken. But we look around and we often walk through life and we look and go, God, thank you that I don't look like them. Thank you that I don't have that sin in my life. Thank you that I don't struggle with that. But where that often comes out is, is we look down our nose at those people because they're lesser than we are. If they only had their act together better. Well, I can tell you, after 20 plus years of walking with God, I don't look at people that way anymore. Their brokenness is tearful to me. Oh, do, is it frustrating from time to time? Sure, it's frustrating from time to time. But it's not frustrating because they frustrate me. It's frustrating because I wish they could receive the peace in their life that I've seen. It's frustrating because I wish they could see beyond their present circumstances to see beyond that. It's frustrating because I want them to experience the same grace, love, and compassion in their lives that I've experienced. And that's where the frustration is. That's where I believe if you walk with God long enough, that's the breaking that he will do in you. The breaking that you need is to be able to see people as his creation and to love them for who they are, to love them because he loves them. And understand this, God's love of them is not an indicator as to whether or not they will accept him and whether or not they will end up in heaven or hell. Their, their future location does not change his perception or love for them. I have two boys. They are completely different people. I love them just alike. Oh, am I frustrated at some of them sometimes? Oh, yeah. Do I want to grab them by their shirt and tell them and tear their bottoms up or whatever? Yeah, I want to do all that stuff. Because in so many ways, they're just like me. And because of that, I know what God would like to do to me sometimes. And so our challenge in this is as we, as we get here, will we get serious about God and will we be changed? Abraham went from a liar to the father of nations. Jacob went from a manipulator to a reconciliation. Moses went from a stutterer to one who talked with God. And Paul went from a murderer to a church planter. So just a matter, imagine, you're not any of those. What could he do with you? How can he transform the world with you? Your extraordinary fate depends on how extraordinary your faith is. And so this morning, this is how we're going to end the service. Um, the worship team is not going to come back up. We're not going to spend time singing as we close, but we're going to take about one or two minutes of just quiet. And I want to encourage you to take a moment and to ask God, what does he want for you? Not what does he want from you, what does he want for you? Where would he love to see you be? Now, in the process, there's probably a few things you'll have to change. But that's still to respond to what he wants for you. And so, at the end of this, uh, Kenny, you can set your clock for like 120 seconds or so. But when that time is up, Kenny's going to come up and he's got a few announcements for you. But I want I want to end this time of service by giving you the opportunity to listen for God. God, what do you want for me? So Father, as I step down, I give you the microphone to their souls. What do you want for each of us? And what do you want for us as a congregation? Father, speak now, for your servants are listening.
close this morning. I'd just like to share with you that uh, this afternoon from 2 to 4 at 111 Cotton Street in West Monroe, there's a bridal shower for Ansley Walden. Uh, ladies, I encourage y'all to go and be a part of that. Uh, the wedding is June the 8th, and that will be over in Benton, Louisiana. Information is available for that if you haven't gotten that. Uh, that will be at 6.30 on June the 8th. Uh, also, too, all the dates for the scene, uh, for camps for this summer are posted in your bulletin as well as on the board in the back uh, in the foyer area. If you know of someone that would like to attend one of the summer camps, please let Pastor Trey or Pastor Ray know, and we'll make sure that those arrangements are made. Please do not allow the cost of camp, which is $150 per uh, camper this year, to uh, be the reason that someone doesn't get to go. If someone wants to go, we'll make sure that the money's available for them to go and participate in church camp. Uh, also, too, next Sunday, uh, we have a little different service next Sunday. It's our annual uh, Live It Out Sunday. Uh, that's where we'll go and do some shopping uh, after a short service here at the church. Uh, this year's a little different than last year. Last year, we bulk shopped and took to Grace Place. This year, they have a new ministry uh, they are actually bagging food items up and sending them uh, on certain days of the week for people who have a need, uh, and uh, they can take that bag home with them, and it has all the essentials that they would need uh, to prepare food for two or three days at their home. So we're not buying bulk can items or things. We're buying individual cans of food or things of that nature. I believe there's a list that's available, or there will be a list that's available next week to help you, but this week if you're out shopping and you, you're wanting to pick up a few things to go along with what's going to be there next week, just remember it would be the kind of things that you would buy for home for you to fix for your family, because that's what we're uh, going to do this time, and, and that way we can help them fill bags to send home with people who have uh, a need. So that's how we'll do that for next Sunday. Uh, also, too, just to let everyone know, so that you're not surprised, we're taking a two-month break from donuts on uh, Sunday mornings. Uh, school's out. A lot of people will be traveling and on vacations, and it uh, depends on what Sunday it is. We either have enough or don't have enough. So we're going to take a two-month two uh, reprieve uh, from the donuts, and we'll start back up in August when school starts again for donuts. Okay? God's good all the time. Thank y'all for being here today.